So what I wish to do is tell you a little bit about the story of the story and then actually look in more detail around the actual title of this talk, which is the role of the RAHS and some people in particular in disseminating and reinforcing and telling that story, which the RAHS has been very active in doing for the past hundred years in particular. So at the time in which Australia is colonised, exploration has become an integral part of Western mentality. There's been several centuries of Europeans in particular going out and exploring the globe and finding new lands. So explorers, in fact, the agents of an imperial ideology, they're out there, they find new territory, they secure that new territory for the home country, the home country then expands through colonies, and they also acquire the assets, the resources, and the strategic possibilities of new regions. So this is something that's been well established at the time at which Australia is settled, and all of us will remember that argument about why, in fact, Botany Bay was founded. Was it for strategic reasons? Was it for convict dumping? Was it for flax? You know, that, that debate. But essentially, explorers are already there as these great characters in the Western European tradition. One of the reasons why explorers are there so strongly is that all cultures around the globe have heroic myths. They all have stories about the people who are the foundational characters or exemplify the key values that societies want their young people to adopt and that are seen as successful in how you actually found your society. So essentially, every culture has heroic myths that person down on the left there is, of course, the famous Greek hero Heracles, which you can tell from his huge club and his lion skin, and um, as a demigod he probably took about size 14 shoes, so he was a pretty scary guy. But essentially, heroic myths do have three stages, as we can see up there. You depart, you go through some kind of trial or initiation, and then you return with the opportunity to provide bounty or benefits to your fellow people. So in the context of the stories about explorers, explorers are tested against the elements. They're particularly battling against an hostile and uh, remote and alien geography. So they're out there struggling with the terrain, if you like. They're worn out by exhaustion and hunger, and yet they battle all the obstacles, and preferably they triumph over adversity. One of the key things about the Blue Mountains Crossing is that it's a story of success, and I'll come back to that shortly. I'm sure most of us would have seen these kind of pictures. They were very prominent even in school history books when I was learning about history. This notion of the blank canvas and the need for the canvas to be filled in by these heroic journeys of discovery. And I would just make the point that it really depends how you look at it and whose eyes you look through, because you can also look at it this way. So the kinds of stories we tell about the kind of country we are and about who's been successful in establishing that country and the things that we value as the achievements of the nation actually change over time. And this story is one of those stories that demonstrates that very clearly. Who tells the story influences what they say and when they tell the story influences also the things that are highlighted in it. If we think about the idea of a first crossing, the thing about a first is that everybody pursues first. Firsts are really important. You say, I was the first one. I got that first. I found the Easter egg on Sunday first. That kind of thing. So firsts will be ardently sought, and they may even be invented. I just have an example here from 1912 um, of a public fountain, which is actually at the Nowra showground. And as you can see, it's erected to the memory of the first white Australian male child born in the Shoalhaven district south of the river. So that's telling you a number of things that are important in 1912. It's important to be Australian born, it's important to be male, but it's important to be white. The other thing that's a really kind of unfortunate corollary of the notion of the first white child, and this happens in all settler societies, you see it also in places like North America, monuments to the first white child or first white settler, it's the last. There's a lot of emphasis in the 19th century about the last of his tribe, the last full-blooded Aboriginal person. So it's really interesting kind of two sides of, of the same coin in a way in terms of how those stories come together and what they say about us perhaps then and, and in some cases even now. The other thing, as I said, was that the first crossing is a story of success. There are plenty of narratives ahead of the crossing about the failure 
the difficulty of trying to cross the Blue Mountains. Here's some um, accounts from the Sydney Gazette. And if you look at this language, the dismal consequences, a rash project, fatal evidence, impossibility, even though the missions are well directed and equipped. They are looking for a useful discovery. And although they've had everything they need, they can't do it. It's just too hard, even though they try. Then we also have, a little bit later, from Governor King, and there are numerous examples of this in the Sydney Gazette. It goes on for years in the Gazette. But some men were actually um, roaming around in the Blue Mountains, and they suggested that they passed them. They got through them. Now, what I find interesting in these remarks by Governor King, there's two things. First of all, the very early occurrence of the term bushranger, people who were roaming around in the bush. This is 1805, and he's talking about them being bushrangers. But also, you can't put any confidence in these people. So this kind of account is something that still resonates when you're trying to unravel the claims of a first crossing. Maybe some convicts did it. The convict John Wilson <coughs> may have actually crossed the mountains. But what Governor King is saying, in my view, in my interpretation of this, is that if you want to successfully cross the Blue Mountains, it will help you if you are the right person from the right class at the right time. So, you know, obviously if you're just a convict and you're wandering around with some mates bush ranging, no one would ever believe that you'd done anything significant. Then we have the successful crossing. We know that the crossing is made by three explorers. One of them's a man of military bearing, one of them's young, only about 23 or 24, although for William Charles Wentworth it depends which date you pick for his birth, how old he is. And the other one is the leader of the expedition, Gregory Blacksland. They also have four convicts or servants. One of those people has the most unfortunate habit and says those words far too often, and I'll come to him shortly. They also have four horses and five dogs. I'm not entirely sure whether the dogs really look like that. Um, <laughs> and people have asked me when I speak what their names are. Um, and I do have a theory, but I'm not sure that with you today. I have a theory about the names of the horses as well. So that's the crossing that's successful. But how is this viewed in 1813, just after it happens? This is how it's reported in the Sydney Gazette. There's an interesting thing here. They're pleased that the party of gentlemen have succeeded in their trackless journey. They haven't been injured. They say that they found fairly good, fine country and quite a lot of it in the direction they travel. But we're not really sure at all whether this is a particularly useful or important discovery. The other thing that this, of course, shows you as well is that you can rely on the media to get it wrong because it was, in fact, the 11th of May that they departed, not the 18th. So don't believe everything that you read in the newspaper. But for me, this is very subdued prose. It's not actually an account of this crossing as a history-making event. I mentioned that there was a gentleman amongst the convicts who said I do far too often, and those of you who are members will have seen the fantastic research that's been done by Christine Yates on covering and naming another one of the convicts, and Joy Hughes, who's sitting very quietly on the other side of the room, also was the first, I think, to identify James Burns. So we now have two of the names of the four convicts, which is really exciting. And if you're not a member of the Royal, you can buy History Magazine for only $5.50 and peruse the exciting life of Samuel Fairs for yourself. Um, because although Darcy Wentworth says on his petition that he knows him to be a sober, honest and industrious man, he was certainly a bigamist. And uh, he, later, he later actually, and well, was probably industrious, but um, he later fell out with the Wentworth. So he's got a fantastic life story. And he lived to a very great age, as you can see from the dates there. So it's fantastic to put a name uh, to one of these extra people. And there's only, in fact, two to go. And I'm sure Christine can do one for each of the remaining history <laughs> magazines throughout the year. But very quickly, we have a privately mounted expedition. And very quickly, the government, which is the person of the government, Lachlan Macquarie, he moves to seize the initiative. And this is an extract from a very long government and general order printed in the Sydney Gazette a bit afterwards. And this is actually about Macquarie reinventing what's happened. He actually says, yes, Blacksland, Wentworth and Lawson did actually achieve the first passage, but only over the most rugged and difficult part of the Blue Mountains. So he's already trying to contract the achievement of private enterprise in mounting that expedition. And he's actually saying, but the governor, 
who is the person of vision in this story and understands what the value would be of more land to the west, he actually sends out the surveyor, George William Evans, to actually confirm the discoveries that have been claimed to have been made by Blackson, Lawson and Wentworth. And then once George Evans, who is a proper official person, says that yes, there is some country out there, and he actually goes much further, as we know, than Blackson, Lawson and Wentworth. He goes all the way to Bathurst. The governor then causes, he says, a road to be constructed for the conveyance of things to the interior, although this does not immediately lead to the opening of the Western Plains for settlement. It's something that, in hindsight, seems inevitable, but it's not something that at the time, although Macquarie does take a trip along the road, and he does actually proclaim the town of Bathurst, so the foundation of Bathurst also occurs fairly quickly after the building of the road, but the land grants out there are not made for a number of years until a fair bit later. So it's not an instantaneous thing. The mountains are crossed, that a road is built, and that it's all jolly hockey sticks from then on. What seems to happen is that shortly afterwards, once Bathurst has got going with the early land grants, Gregory Blackson moves, I think, to seize back the initiative and the credit for private enterprise. He's actually done a few different versions in manuscript of his journal, and he publishes a journal in 1823. And one of the strong themes about the crossing is the way the Blackson family in each generation moved to a new way of commemorating this crossing and actually keeping the name of their ancestor Gregory and the name Blacksland prominent in the way the story is told. So um, this happens again with John Blacksland and again with Charles Rafe Blacksland who is uh, then heavily involved with the RAHS as an expert because he's the key person from the family who's working with the RAHS in the early part of the 20th century. But interestingly enough, he says specifically in the preface to his edition in 1904 that he really needs to publish it because he has to correct the impression that Wentworth may have been the leader. So he wants to make sure that everybody knows. Why is this so important in this story? One of the reasons is because of what happens in Australian exploration afterwards. There are a series of journeys. People look for an inland sea. It isn't there. People look for an El Dorado. It isn't there. There's a lot of failure in Australian exploration. There are explorers who disappear and are not ever seen again. There are also great dramas, things like the Burke and Wills expedition, where eventually they're recovered and they have a major public funeral in Melbourne, a huge funeral cortege stretching through the streets of Melbourne. And as the century moves on, explorers are becoming very much part of the national psyche, and that's a detail there of the great doors at the public library up the road where you actually see a whole lot of historic figures. You also see historic figures linked to land survey and settlement and exploration on the lands department. The lands department is just down the hill in Bridge Street and it's built in two stages. It's one stage is finished in 1877 and a later stage is finished in 1888. Now if you want to see the grouping of Blacks and Lawson and Wentworth. They're on the Gresham Street corner of that building. And uh, interestingly enough, the person who is grouped with them is the person who was the Minister for Lands at the time, James Squire Farnell. And he is actually the person who claims credit for the memorialising of the Explorer's Tree near Katoomba. So Henry Parks is kind of grabbing the front corner on Bridge Street, but J.S. Farnell is saying, no, no, I want to be with the big three. So, I'll just, I'll just put myself there. So I think, I think it's quite interesting you know, how this um, story and the linkages are unfolding. 1888, of course, is also the centennial year for the um, foundation of New South Wales. Those centennial celebrations are not really national in character. Some of the other colonies are not at all impressed by the fact that New South Wales is banging on about how they have a longer history than anybody else. And the bulletin in particular rants and raves in its editorials about the childish and frothy and frivolous celebrations worked up by the pitiable politicians of New South Wales to look back on the history of a colony founded on the triple foundation of the cat, the gallows and rum. So not everyone is singing from the same song sheet here, but there is certainly an effort to look back and say, okay, what's actually happening. And this is something that's well underway, particularly in the 1880s, there's a lot of evidence for it with the run-up to the team ring. But the other thing that I think becomes critical in this period is the move towards federation, the debate about whether federation will or won't happen, and that notion of an Australian identity. 
by the time you get to the 1880s and the 1900s, the people who are starting to write about Australia and document the stories about Australia are from a generation born usually after the end of convict transportation. They're not people who are visiting the country to write about it and tell its stories. They are people who are Australian born. A lot of the key protagonists are also born after the ending of convict transportation to New South Wales. And I think that becomes interesting in terms of the erasure of that episode from the nation's history. One of the main pieces of rhetoric about the Blue Mountains explorers, and this is already having somewhat of a revival in 2013, is the Dauntless Three. And the Dauntless Three, that phrase is used about the three explorers all the time as a result of this Blue Mountains Pioneers poem by Henry Kennell. It's a very long poem, but you can see this, this notion of they conquered the hills, they faced the green west, it was a vast land, it would have resources, it would have opportunity, and this is a prophetic thing. This is the illustration that was published when the poem appeared in the Sydney Mail, and this is also an illustration that really does get around. It's on the cover of my book, but that's largely because it's out of copyright. But it's a fantastic event, as this reconstruction shows. We've got William Charles Wentworth holding his hat up, experiencing the revelation of the promised land, We've got the other explorers and, of course, the horses and an unenthusiastic looking dog. The other interesting thing about this image is that it's actually showing the geography, not of Mount Blacksland at all, but of Mount York. And that also becomes an important thing, that Mount York starts to become the place that is recognised and associated with that moment of success. As I said, Australia is heading very strongly, although New South Wales didn't particularly want to do it, for federation. Federation occurs and you're getting again this notion of two things really. The review of where the colonies got to, how long it took, how successful it is. By then you have the mineral discoveries of the West, you've had the gold rushes, you started to get waves of immigration in the later 19th century and in the 20th century that hugely symbolic thing of starting a new nation on the first day of a new century in 1901, although I think centrally sections start at a particular date, but maybe I'm just numbers obsessed. But this is, again, a really long poem by Banjo Patterson, who is one of those people born in the 1860s, born in the Central West near Orange, writes a very, very long poem, writes many poems that document the notion of the bush. I find this poem extraordinary, not so much because of its themes about pioneers and how it was difficult to break through, but this line here, there was not much of blood, no war was fought between the seas. I mean, what happened after the crossing, particularly for the Wiradjuri people around Bathurst, was a state of open warfare. Martial law was declared. It was fairly dire. And yet, by the time Patterson is born in the 1860s, that's something that also is not, not a memory that's kind of coming through the history of that area. That's also reinforced by some of the pioneer families. It's not just the Blacksons that are anxious to take credit for the prosperity and success of, uh, in particular, rural Australia. One of the people who's quite influential in this period is Ida Louisa Lee, Mrs Charles Marriott. She actually lives in England for a long time. This gives her access to records and charts, particularly at the Admiralty, which are not at that time available in Australia. So she's able to do research on sources that other Australian historians don't have, and uh, she writes some fairly influential books. The interesting thing about the Lees as well is that they're descended from convicts, but they never acknowledge that. And Ida Lee's niece was actually Ida Trail of Miss Trail's house in Bathurst, and uh, she never ever acknowledged that convict origin amongst the family. The other thing about Ida as well, I think she's great, not only because she has a spiffing horse and a nice outfit, but she's the first female honorary fellow of the Royal Australian Historical Society. And even now, we've only ever had about four honorary fellows who are actually women, and Ida Lee was the first. The other pioneer families that get in on the act are um, the daughters, in fact, of George Henry Cox, who put out the memoirs of William Cox, which includes the journal and all sorts of introductions about how the pioneers were men of true British grit. And then the MacArthur's also get in on the act because quite clearly what really counts in rural Australia is sheep. So the MacArthur's make sure that they get their family records into the public domain so that everyone knows that they are the reason why Australia is prosperous. It's their efforts with sheep that have actually laid the foundations for the success that Australia is um, enjoying. 
Also around this period, the um, Pioneers Club is formed. They meet just down the road and they're actually formed by a descendant of George Johnson. So there's this harking back to origins, but it's also looking at origins from prominent families, successful families, families that can say that current prosperity is based on their ancestors' efforts. Again, 1901, what a significant year, the formation of the Australian Historical Society. Learned societies start to be formed. We actually have a range of people with an education, with respectable occupations, who decide that they will come together to investigate matters to do with history in the past. They're confident that they can actually record the truth about the past, and they start to develop a narrative which is about the rapid progress made by great men and the unnamed mass of pioneers. The key thing about this, though, apart from the fact that they all had very fantastic moustaches and beards, and you can see the original of this photo just down in the hall outside, history becomes a collective effort. They're doing it together. It's not just individuals writing bits and pieces or with access to their own family records, delving through them and saying what they mean. If we think about the pioneer, though, just very quickly, the other thing that's gone on in this period, there are major upheavals in Australia. There is the Shearer's strike, which actually leads to the formation of the Australian Labor Party. There is a huge maritime strike. The pioneer is not just something that's painted in lovely views of bush. The notion of the bush itself, this romantic notion of the pioneer struggling in the bush, there are several things going on there, which I don't have really time to elucidate today, but one of them is that the bush is empty, that the land is empty, so that you can take the land and develop it. And the other thing too is that the kind of cultural custodians of the nation, the people who are commissioning the literature or purchasing the literature or commissioning and, and purchasing the art, they are Edwardian conservatives. They are coming from a class of rural squatters, rural conservatives, conservative patrons of art and literature, and that will become quite influential in how these stories are told. We also have, just before 1913, the last great phase of exploration, the expedition to the South Pole, and of course, again, this fantastic story of heroic failure, in fact, that after all of that effort, after everybody dying, they don't actually get there first. So first is important yet again. This brings us to the 1913 centenary of the Blue Mountains Crossing. Now, one of the people who is very influential in this, there is a local move in the Blue Mountains, particularly through Blackson Shire, where the president is a fellow called John William Berghofer. He's actually a naturalised Australian, he's a German by birth, and he's quite interested. One of the reasons why they focus on Mount York is because that's actually where Berghofer thinks the crossing finished. When it's pointed out to him that it didn't finish at Mount York, he says, oh, that doesn't matter because Mount York's a nice place and it's easy to get to by railway. So it would be much better, in fact, um, to, to have the celebrations there. Frank Walker, look at the dates again. Born in the 1860s, born in Victoria. He marries Alice Penfold, who is, in fact, the sister of William Clark Penfold. And he works um, as a stationer. And I just put Penfold's horses in because horses have a big, a big role in this story. Frank is a very keen photographer and cyclist. He gives a paper in 1909 about the Western Road, which is his initial research interest. He also has a research interest in Governor Macquarie. And in that paper, he, he states that even by 1909, he cycled some 27,000 miles over 12 years, photographing sites, talking to the locals, getting the stories of the sites. When the RHS is formed in 1901, he's the first uh, honorary treasurer. He becomes president in 1912 and again in 1913, and in fact the constitution of the royal is changed to allow him to have a consecutive term as president, because at that stage that requires an amendment to the constitution. And as you can see, he's then vice president eight times, and he remains active and on the council of the RAHS until his death in 1948. That picture of Frank as an older gentleman, those of you with really good eyesight will see that he's photographed with a photograph of William Lawson. So even as an elderly person, he's maintaining his focus and his interest and his links to the crossing. One of the things that lets Frank become the expert on the crossing is that uh, in 1913, he publishes an official history of the first crossing. This is because official sources are much better than private sources. They can be verified, they can be validated. So Frank, the word official in this title is, is quite important. And also, 
course, Frank has very strong links to printing and publishing. He's able to get things done. There are plenty of stories in the newspapers of the day. A lot of those stories have copy that's um, written by Frank. He's not necessarily given the byline for them, but um, there's certainly his work. And he also reanalyzes Blackson's journal and publishes a new edition of that for 1913 in conjunction with Charles Rafe Blackson, Blackson's grandson. The other issue they have in 1913 is actually raising the money. So they put out brochures trying to raise funds, they put out an official program of the celebrations. There's a massive event held at Mount York, the New South Wales Governor and a parade of state and local dignitaries are there. There are thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people. They've gone on a special purpose deputation to the Premier to get a special purpose grant to have the celebrations. They get £700. That grant is used partly to build the pavilion, which is now at Mount York, but also to stage the celebrations. And as you can see from these pictures, they also spend a very large amount of that money cutting the trees down. Because there's no point in actually going somewhere to look at the view of the Western Plains if you can't <laughs> see them. So we're looking at, up in the mountains at the moment and planning a celebration at Mount York on the 28th of May 2013. And there is no way you could fit that many people there now because there are trees there and we can't cut them down. The other thing that they do, which I think is partly coming from the tradition of commemorative China anyway, but also I think as a definite fundraising effort, and the RAHS has a few of these pieces in its collection. I won't talk about this in detail because I have spoken about this once before at Australia Day a few years ago, but they actually put out a range of souvenir China, which of course has the three explorers, it has Wentworth, Blackson and Lawson, as you, as you look across the plate. And it's quite interesting. This is uh, the Victoria Mark, which was made in Austria, which, because of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it's called Austria, but was actually, it's now in the Czech Republic. There's various different base marks for this china. And the other thing about it is that it's only possible to get this kind of china because from about 1910 onwards, you get the decal. You get a, this technology of using a decal where you can make a transfer to do transfer printing on china from a photographic plate. And it actually means that once you have a decal, you can manufacture the china absolutely anywhere. So you don't have to have china about Australian destinations being manufactured in Australia. So this is this is quite interesting. These two actually come from my collection because who else would want to unplug with these flawless monuments about your planet? But as you can see, there's also a whole series of them for the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So it's a feature even now of Blue Mountains tourism. Also, in the early part of the 20th century, we get the development of Empire Day. We get the explorers being fitted into the Empire Day story about great men and heroes and the expansion of the British Empire. They've secured this territory. We also very quickly, in World War I, get the tradition of Anzac Day. It's first commemorated only one year after, in 1916. And you also then get a slight recasting of the explorer's story that they're triumphing through, you know, it's a heroic struggle and triumph through hostile terrain. Then, once you get to the end of the war, the Australian Historical Society actually applies to obtain the prefix royal. This is a fantastic thing for them. It's very jolly. It gives them huge status as part of the establishment. They're actually a Royal Australian Historical Society now. And one of the people who becomes very influential, he really in a way for this story takes over from Frank Walker's role is Carl Cramp, who was born in Surrey in the 1870s, but he's very active in the affairs of the RHS from about 1910 until the 1950s. He's also very influential because he works for the Ministry of Public Instruction, and doesn't that sound good? Um, and he writes very influential school history textbooks, the story of the English people, and the story of the Australian people. Now he basically adopts Frank Walker's RHS version. In 1938, he's also the chief advisor to the New South Wales government for the sesquicentenary celebrations. These are a very large program of events. There's a pageant of nationhood. There's a reenactment of Phillips Landing. You can see on the building illumination there, the one on the left is the crossing of the Blue Mountains. The one in the middle is Governor Macquarie, the builder. And the one on the right is Sturt exploring the Murray. And if you look at the reenactment, the thing to notice there, with all those um, great uniforms, there are no convicts and there are no women. And in fact, Carl Cram specifically says there's no need to have convicts in the reenactment because that's something in Australian history which has been overemphasised. And he is supported in that view by a majority vote of the RAHS Council. 
where were the women? They were in the Women's Weekly. Um, <laughs> patterns for how to actually make really groovy company in front. And um, possibly also, um, I don't know that I would take on making the gentleman's outfit, but um, there were perhaps patterns for that as well. In the mid 20th century, the story kind of barreled on. There's lots of repetition and reproduction of the Frank Walker text. It's in many other books, not always even acknowledged, but it's Frank's text. You start to get a little bit of a change. Eleanor Dark publishes the Timeless Land trilogy, and in one of those novels, she actually has a specific character who's probably based on the convict John Wilson, who lives in the Burrowbarang Valley and can get backwards and forwards through the mountains without much trouble. Eleanor and her husband Eric Dark lived at Katooma. They formed the first ever rock climbing club in Australia, the Blue Mountain Mountaineers, and it was popularly known to the locals as the Katooma Suicide Club. So they obviously didn't find the terrain terribly difficult at all. But Catherine Gaston, in her novel, also has a character called Charlie Wentworth who really just wants to cross the mountains and can't understand why officialdom is holding him back. So yeah, the story's starting to verbal up in different ways with a different emphasis on, on who else may have been around or what else may have been possible. We also have the geographers looking at it and the geographers start to make the argument that it wasn't really that the terrain was very difficult, it was that there wasn't sufficient reason or motivation that the mountains needed to be crossed. Then, as well, in the 20th century, this is uh, the reenactment that was done for the Federation Jubilee in 1951. Fantastic events with the explorers marching up and down the main streets of Blue Mountains towns, which of course weren't there in 1813. It's a fantastic event, a Jubilee ball at Glenbrook, and I just had to put this in because I can't help myself. The highlight of the night was staged by a party impersonating <laughs> Kelly. With toy pistols, they entered the hall and held up the dance. After collecting jewellery, etc., and taking the girl as captive, they called on the mayor to give himself up. Ned Kelly then placed a noose over the mayor's head and stated he would be lynched for not giving proper attention to the roads in the area. <laughs> the, I mean, this still happens up there. The mayor was saved by the timely arrival of the cops. The gang made a hasty exit, but not before the girl captive had been dumped on the floor. So finally, women had a role in the hospital. I won't dwell on this too long, um, but you know it's really interesting that Ned Kelly would pop up. There's a complete distortion of space and time there by introducing Ned into the narrative. And of course, he's an Irish-Australian folk hero. He's very different from the um, British explorers. And uh, I actually think that it's quite interesting that Australian Sun, which was a significant biography of Kelly, has come out only a few years earlier in 1948. The Mountains is really enthused by the notion of reenactment, so they do it all again for their 1963 sesquicentenary. A stamp is put out by Australia Post, and now when they have a reenactment, they have encounters with Aborigines, which are, who are white people, of course, blacked up and wearing kangaroo skin, and they do things like force the explorers to eat witchy grubs made of icing sugar. So even though there was no actual contact on the 1813 expedition, this is something, it's, it's the way the story is that there's this trope now of savages in the bush and peril and difficulty, so of course you have to have some in your reenactment. At the very close of the 20th century, there's a new kind of analysis of this story, and this is undertaken by Chris Cunningham, who is again a geographer, and he actually starts to mount the argument that there's a cumulative process of discovery, and there's possibly 20 expeditions, and it's kind of this notion that maybe gradually over time knowledge of how to get through the mountains spreads through diffusion and he also thinks that there's no way that explorers were heroic and that any modern bushwalker can relate to the experience. I'm not sure that's true because fairly recently, only a few years ago, we actually had an English tourist get lost down the bottom of the scenic railway at Katooba and he was vanished and missing for nine days and yet he was within you know five kilometres of the main Blue Mountains town so I think what you think about the terrain depends on who you are. Now, if I quickly turn to the sites, there's a whole range of sites here, and I'll try and concentrate mostly on the ones that the RAHS has had a big role in. They basically go throughout the mountains. This is the mid and upper mountains. Cayley's Repulse is at Linden, and you can see Lithgow at the top there with Hassan's Walls and Mount Blacksland. The first site that everybody knows about is the Mark Tree. The RAHS doesn't have much to do with this. It's all happening really in an era before the RAHS is formed. The problem for the tree is that it doesn't have a long historic dimension. It's not in early accounts. It's not in early records. It's not until the 1870s that people are actually talking about a tree that's marked with something 
uh, near Katoomba. The initials were in a blaze at the bottom of the tree, and this view on the left shows you that the blaze with the historic initials, if they existed at all, was the first part to decay, which makes it even harder to work out what they said and what they looked like. The photograph on the right is actually from the RNHS collection and was taken shortly after the tree was renovated with a um, cement capping to protect it from the weather and a new fence um, in 1930. The tree, or the X tree as I like to think of it, continues to kind of stagger on throughout the 20th century. In the 21st century though, it doesn't fare terribly well at all. There's an arson attack which tries to set fire to it. It doesn't work because the tree's largely concrete, so it doesn't burn. Um, but in 2012, a four-wheel drive missed the corner. There was a DUI incident by an uninsured driver, and so the tree is looking pretty tragic. And uh, there's recently been a report on the tree that, you know, um, I don't think anything will happen to it in 2013, but who knows. Mount York, key site for the crossing. As I mentioned earlier, there were trustees of the local reserve and one of those was Burkhofer, who was also the president of Blackson Shire. Uh, he wanted to build an, an obelisk for the memory of the explorers. They start fundraising for it in the 1890s and they build it in 1900. Also then with the centennial celebrations, Frank Walker, the president of the RAHS, is involved with that local committee. They get the government grant, they build the pavilion, on the right is the pavilion in its lovely heritage colour scheme, which is historically inaccurate, and I'm pleased to say that I've ranted and raved often enough about that, that it's about to be repainted in more normal, traditional pavilion colours. There's also Mount York, it illustrates what I call the Lavelle satellite theory of monuments, which is once you have a big one, it attracts smaller ones, <laughs> and this certainly goes on there. There's this fantastic rubble work archway. You can see the great symbolism there, the three peaks for the three explorers. Unfortunately, that arch collapses, and when they put it back, they don't worry about the finickettiness of the three peaks for the three explorers, but that arch is still there today. Again, at the big dates, this one slightly misses the sesquicentenary mark, but in 1968, this monument with the three explorers' heads is uh, put at Mount York. And um, unfortunately, though, Mount York is not a destination anymore for historic pilgrimage, except when the RAHS goes there occasionally on pilgrimages. But um, the monuments have been vandalised and uh, people treat them with disrespect. You can see this young gentleman <coughs> helpfully climbing on the arch the day I was there, which was very helpful on because I could prove that um, people don't treat them with respect. And even though it's a day use area, people camp all over it, hang their washing in trees. My point is they're not visiting this as a place of historic pilgrimage for historic experience. They're into outdoor pursuits like rock climbing and abseiling. Hassan's Walls, um, the Lithgow Council or oh, Blacks on Shire, as it is said, is also um, active in wanting to um, commemorate the crossing appropriately. Hassan's Walls is a big area with a natural reserve, a native nature reserve. They want to build a shelter shed, but once they're talking in Blue Mountains about a pavilion, they rapidly rename their, sh their shelter shed a pavilion, and they have three openings for viewpoints, and those openings are called Blacks on Lawson and Wentworth. <laughs> Being an archaeologist, I of course have found the site of the pavilion. That arrow points to the octagonal base of the pavilion under a more up-to-date, nicer picnic shed. The local community also gets in on the act. They get inspired by the kind of grandness of the celebrations at Mount York. So um, they do a lamp at Lawson. The Lawson lamp was recently affected by highway widening. It was demolished, but it has been reconstructed and it looks pretty much the way it did. This brings me to Kaylee's Repulse at Linden. Now, this is a really unimpressive site. A little pile of rocks in a rather nasty galvanised pipe rail fence that dates from the 1970s. But there is a clue when you visit it that it might be more than meets the eye, and that's the plaque. This pile of stones, restored in 1913 and originally named in error Covey's Repulse, was discovered and identified September the 6th, 1912, by a party of members of the Australian Historical Society. Now, you would not think, when you actually look at this pile of rocks, that this was something that had actually, in many people, had invested almost a decade looking for this pile of stones. Why was it important? It was important because it was an early feature that was noted on early maps of the Western Road. The one on the left is Evans's plan, and you can see that it says Coley's Repulse, it says water, and it says Coley's Repulse. 
the three explorers mention in their journals that when they got to the vicinity of Lyndon, they came across a pile of stones, probably built up by a European. They speculated as to who may have built it. And then also on the government tracing of uh, the realignment of the road, there's a pile of stones shown again. So basically what happens is that Frank Bladen from the Public Library, he actually starts writing to the locals of Lyndon. He writes to the postmistress in 1906 and says, do you know where this is? Because what's happened is the Western Road has been deviated and moved away. So a road landmark disappears. The other issue with Coney's Repulse is George Coney was never in that area of the Blue Mountains. So once they've been researching the explorers' journals and researching the history of the crossings, Frank Walker and some of the other protagonists in this story work out that it's named for the wrong person and in the wrong spot. But they still want to find it because the three explorers have found it. Governor Macquarie is named at Cayley's Repulse, thinking that Cayley had been in that area. They want to find it. So they start talking to the locals. The locals say, oh, there's a pile of rocks over there. So very eminent people. That's um, Joseph Maiden, the director of Botanic Gardens. He's interested in finding these sites and these places because he's interested in the plant collecting that goes on with some of the early explorers. People like Alan Cunningham, who were out there collecting botanical specimens, and of course, Cayley was also a botanical collector. So he's trying to find the terrain that they've traveled and, and the markers that they may or may not have left. So that's Maiden and Maguan, um, photographed with a pile of stones. They think they've got it. The report comes back from Frank Bladen. I've been up and looked at it, and I don't think it presents the right appearance. It's not what one would expect from a significant early landmark. I think it's an old cooking fireplace. Okay, bang. So, Frank is not dismayed. Frank mounts several more expeditions in search of it. This is the first president of the RAHS, Dr Andrew Howison, with what Walker then names Cairn Number 2 in 1911. Walker races into print in the sun. He says... Historic Mountain Memorial discovered at last. He writes this long article about how they've searched and searched and they found the object that they've been looking for for so long, for years and years. And he concludes this paragraph in the Sun newspaper with interested parties must accept this statement. Well, interested parties do not accept that statement. So there's a debate in the pages of the Sun newspaper and what happens then is they have to go out and look again. So they do go out and look again, and this time they send a huge party from the RAHS. There's about half the council, and right in the middle of this photograph you can see the fabulous Mrs Foster. There she is. And as you can see there, this is one of the historical postcard series that were put out in the early 20th century. But the remains of this long-lost relic was made by a party of members of the Australian Historical Society. What actually happened was they go out, they think they've got it, it's a scattered pile of stones, so they actually built it the way it had been built, had it been built And that is why I have used the title of my talk of the RAHS Making History, because they did. After they are sure that they've secured the real site of Cody's Repulse, Frank, who was quite an excellent draftsman, and Frank's actually the person who drew the RAHS logo, so he was, so he was a very neat and competent draftsman. He prepares a number of sketch maps, and you can see here that he's got, these are maps actually in the collection of the Mitchell Library, but you've got the real Coley's Repulse, located in September 1912, and then these other ones, remains of a second cairn, remains of this, remains of that. So he's quite honest in documenting, I thought I had it, but then I didn't. And this is just a, a modern map by um, Alan Andrews, which actually shows the kind of differences. So in fact, when you look at where the piles of stones are in the beginning, and where the pile of stone is now, it would appear that none of them are in fact Cayley's Repulse. And the other interesting thing, which I don't have time to pursue right now, is that there's quite, through Woodford and Linden in the mountains, there's quite a lot of uh, stone arrangements which are of Aboriginal origin. So it's a really interesting thing that the explorers may have seen a stone arrangement and assumed it was a European one, but unless we can find what they saw, we've got very little chance of unravelling what it really may have been. There are more sites as the 20th century keeps going after 1913. There's a vast attempts to keep claiming the legend by local communities and spreading the legend geographically. A cairn is erected at Glenbrook where there's a recent highway deviation. It's erected in 1928. It took me a long time to crack this. I'm not good at maths. 
but 1928 is 115 years since <laughs> And this site is based on the mapping and the republication of the journal by Walker. He puts a campsite in the vicinity of Glenbrook, so the, the tablet says camped here. The wording is later changed. The RAHS does a series of excursions to the Blue Mountains in the 1930s, where in the run up to the uh, sesquicentennial celebrations, and a vast debate breaks out, which you can read in the old issues of the RAHS journal, about whether the monument is in the right place. They decide that it's not in the right place, so they actually change the wording on this monument to Blackson, Wentworth, and Lawson Pass nearby. <laughs> and you know, we could all have one of those. <laughs> 1938, Sesquic Centenary. St Mary's wants to get in on the act. Crikey, the crossing actually started from here. We actually need to get in on the act of this. So there we have Carl Cramp unveiling the can. Cramp uses the same rhetoric again, the heroic explorers, the foundations of modern prosperity, the value of the wheat and the wool industries to New South Wales, etc, etc. Penrith decides that uh, they could do bigger and better than that, so they also put up a really fantastic monument, a nice art echo monument in the 1930s. That monument's unveiled by the governor, uh, Lord Wakehurst, but again, Carl Cramp makes an appearance and gives a long speech, and his speech is uh, published in the RAHS journal, and also the, so a lot of this material is also in the RAHS annual reports where they talk about excursions and those kind of events. Interestingly enough, this monument refers to Blacks and Lawson, Wentworth and servants, and that wording is um, specifically recommended by the RAHS by two councillors, Bernard Dowd and uh, Ward Havar, because they want the wording to be more inclusive. So I think that's interesting that the RAHS council in 1938 is saying don't have convicts in the reenactment, but at the same time is saying put something else a little bit more inclusive on the memorial. So there's a tension there, if you like. Just going back very quickly to Mount Blacksland, Mount Blacksland, again, it's a key site. It's actually the place where the crossing ended. But it falls into obscurity. There are road deviations. The road to Bathurst goes way away from Mount Blackson. It goes via Lithgow and Rydal and other places. They do want to put a marker on Mount Blackson in 1913, and they succeed in doing that. They have a cairn of stones there. It's cairn things really happening. And they also put up some plaques. But by the 1960s, in 1963, there's a big descendants reunion for the sesquicentenary at Penrith. And Keith Blacksland, a descendant of Gregory, talks to the rest of the descendants, and most of them think that the crossing stopped at Mount York. He thinks that's not good enough at all. They don't know the truth, they don't know where it really happened, they don't realise how important Mount Blacksland is. So the Mount Blacksland landmark is built over a five to six year campaign. There's a huge debate about whether the landmark should be built. It will require things like tree clearing. It will be an intrusion on the natural landscape. The National Parks Advisory Committee recommends against it. Keith Blacksland and the RAHS mobilise. They want a landmark. Of course they want it to be unsubtle. What's the point of having a sighting <laughs> target from Mount York if you can't see it? Interestingly enough, halfway through the project, the engineer changes. The new engineer is James Macquarie Antill who is in fact an Antwerp descendant and at that time the Vice President of the RAHS. They also get support from William Charles Wentworth IV, who is an MP, and eventually the Minister for Lands, Tom Lewis, just uh, gives up. I've actually seen the original memos on the files at the Orange Lands Office and after the RAHS prepares more and more reports saying why this is essential to be built, he actually just writes, I suppose we should just go along with them. But it's clearly just um, over giving all these ministerials. So as you can see, it's a spectacular structure up close. Unfortunately, Mount Blackson is a landlocked public reserve, so it's difficult to get to. It is uh, cost about $2,000 in 1968 for just materials. They blew holes in the face of the mountain with dynamite so they could concrete in the framework. It's an extraordinary tale, actually. And it sits there as this sighting target on the face of the mountain. The other interesting thing is that from Mount Blackson, you can't see anything. If you actually look west, you can see nothing at all because it's actually a lower mountain than the rest of the Great Dividing Range and the Tablelands, which are still beyond it. But what you do get is this fantastic view back, in fact, to Mount York.
the Brush Farm Historical Society climbed Mount Blacksland in 1993 for 180 years since the crossing. They were very concerned about the condition of the parks. They made representations to their local MP, who was um, Andrew Tink, and that resulted in a new ceremony with replacement plaques put up in 1994. But this brings us to the burning question of this story, which is, of course, what's next? Now, one of the things that I've argued very strongly, and here I've actually quoted myself because that proves how credible I am, <laughs> because I've been writing about this forever. I predicted back in 2004 that um, the narrative was very resilient, it was very adaptable, and I had no doubt that the story would remould again to suit changing circumstances. And it, it is happening. One of the things that I've argued vis-a-vis -vis Mount Blacksland in particular is that every generation of Blacksland's has sought a way to bring the story to new audiences, originally through publishing the journal, then through being involved in the centenary celebrations, then through the Mount Blacksland landmark for the sesquicentenary, even though it was a five or six year campaign to get it built. This year, Wendy Blacksland, who is a well-known and widely published children's author and a playwright, she has actually written a play in Crossing, which is going to be performed in all the local schools throughout the area and possibly subject to the success of that first run, keep going until 2015 and go in a much wider area of New South Wales. And this is the photograph of the official launch of the 2013 Bicentenary, which happened in teeming monsoonal conditions at Echo Point in February. And uh, I just put in the ad from the paper because I think that phrase our history, our stories, actually exemplifies exactly what this story is about. Who tells the story, why do they tell the story, when do they tell the story, and how do they tell the story. Thank you.